The following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up, the greatest threat to democracy. China has been trying to realize its kind of ambition to become the global superpower. China is on the move. What's behind this new Red Scare? And can they be stopped? They not only had the right, but they were compelled by heaven to rule the world. Today on The 700 Club. Welcome. You know, I want to say something to you. God is never late. We declared on this program, and you joined with me, that God Almighty was going to do a miracle and stop the theft of our election and the fraud that was being perpetrated on the American people, and that God himself would intervene. Well, I have before you right now, this is the brief that is being filed by the state of Texas, and there are 18 now state's attorneys general who had joined in this suit, and they're going to the Supreme Court to say this election was rigged, you've got to overturn it. So here's what they're asking. Uh, using COVID-19 pandemic as a justification, the defendant states of Georgia, Michigan, and Wisconsin, and the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania usurped their legislators' authorities and unconstitutionally revised the state's election statutes. They accomplished these statutory revisions through executive fiat or friendly lawsuits, thereby weakening ballot integrity. And they flooded the defendant states with millions of ballots to be sent through the mail. That was the first. And so the court is the only forum that can delay the deadline of the appointment of presidential electors under the law to safeguard public legitimacy at this unprecedented moment and restore public confidence, the court should extend the December 14th, 2020 deadline for defendant state certification of presidential elections. And the plaintiff states request one, the court declare that the defendant states of Pennsylvania, Georgia, Michigan, and Wisconsin administered the 2020 presidential election in violation of the electors clause and the 14th amendment of the U.S. Constitution and B, declare that any electoral college votes cast by such presidential electors appointed in defendant states in Pennsylvania, Georgia, Michigan, and Wisconsin are in violation of the electors clause and the 14th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution and cannot be counted. And then it goes on to say, if any of the defendant states have already appointed presidential electors to the electoral college using the 2020 election results, such states' legislatures should appoint a new set of presidential election in a manner that does not violate the electors clause and the 14th Amendment or appoint no electors at all. And the only date in the Constitution that's really set is not the 14th of December. It is the 20th of January uh, when a new president is supposed to be sworn in and there's time to get this thing fixed. And it could mean if, if it's thrown back to the states, the states can either set of uh, let the legislatures take charge or if the states vote they vote as a unit so each state has one vote and the majority of the states are controlled by republicans as are the legislatures well uh, it's an incredible thing but we were praying for a miracle and we saw these fraudulent things taking place in state after state after state and the uh the lawyers were losing. As I said, it's like you go into a football game and the referee rules against you and you don't challenge and he rules against you and you don't challenge and he rules against you and you don't challenge. And then when the game's over and the uh, decision or the results are in the record books, then you say, I want to challenge it. It's too late. And that's what I talked to Jay Sackle about this. He said, it's really uh, the Trump team uh, didn't get in gear. But nevertheless, there is a miracle taking place, and you are praying for it, and I would ask you to pray, because it looks like Ted Cruz, who was a former attorney general of Texas, will argue the case before the Supreme Court. He is a brilliant constitutional attorney, and uh, he will uh, have, I asked Jay, I said, are you gonna argue it? He said, no, no, Ted Cruz would be the appointed as the attorney general of Texas. 
But 18 states now are asking for this. And once again, this is the motion for leave to file a bill of contain. Ken Paxton, Attorney General of Texas, and then all these other uh, Texas uh, legislatures. And, and this is the authorities. They, they list huge numbers of authorities, whole pages of authorities. And it's a, in the Supreme Court of the United States, a brief in support of a motion for uh, leave to file uh, and it's statement of the case, and it's all here, very, very carefully worked out with uh, citations. Ted Cruz arguing. And ladies and gentlemen, if you want to pray, I would pray. Because we cannot have our election system destroyed the way this was. There's more, there are more irregularities. It just it boggles the mind when we see what is done. And I think it's time also that we should have a special uh, prosecutor, a special counsel, whatever term you want to give it, uh, to actually pursue this. Because if one is appointed, then they have special rules, and these people have their own little jurisdiction, and they should uh, uh, investigate the fraud that has been taking place all over. So, uh, oh, wow. Uh, that, it's, it's exciting what we, the time we're living in, but God is in control. But I, I would ask you, pray as you have never prayed before as this case goes before the Supreme Court, because we do not wish to have our elections stolen by crooked activity that took place. So if the court does rule in favor of Texas, what does it mean? John Jessup can amplify that for us. Well, as Pat just outlined, President Trump's legal team is joining a Supreme Court bid by Texas to overturn the presidential election. Attorneys General and 18 other states are taking part. The suit charges that officials in Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Georgia changed election procedures, something they argue only state legislatures are allowed to do. This is the most significant of the cases filed, and it's the most significant because it is, as Jordan just said, completely outcome determinative. What does that mean? It means that if the court were to rule in favor of Texas, those four states, the states named in the complaint, would in fact uh, have their state legislatures determine the outcome. They, they would pick the electors. Now, several things would have to happen for the case to succeed. If the court decides indeed to hear the case, the justices would have to first block certification of the Electoral College vote, then determine that massive amounts of votes are illegal and tell the states to retally and resubmit their votes. The court also could let every state legislature decide who won and then put the election in the hands of the House of Representatives. In a state-on-state -state suit, our only place to go is the U.S. Supreme Court. We can't be heard anywhere else. Other lawsuits start at a district court level, and they have a right to be heard at least once, whether they have a good case or a bad case. So our request is we want to be heard. The only place we can go is the U.S. Supreme Court. And so we're pleading with the U.S. Supreme Court, please hear our case. Give us a chance at least to argue what we think is right. We want to argue the Constitution. Well, basically, Texas is asking if the states have not certified their electoral results yet, they're asking the Supreme Court to order those states to conduct a new election. And if the states have already certified their electoral results, they're asking the Supreme Court to order those states to have the state legislature appoint the electors, uh, regardless of the election outcome. So it would certainly have a very dramatic impact, a very drastic impact, and frankly, could overturn the results of the elections in these you know, these four states uh, during this past election cycle. So it's a very a big ask uh, and one that I think the Supreme Court is very unlikely uh, to grant. Now, the four states being challenged have until three o'clock this afternoon to respond to the Texas suit. And Pat, President Trump has asked, as you said, Senator Ted Cruz from Texas to represent him before the court. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it, it will certainly be there, but we've been looking for a miracle. And I do not believe, frankly, that if you got 18 states coming before the Supreme Court and a man like Ted Cruz arguing that the Supreme Court is just going to brush it aside. If it was one state, they'd say, well, we're not going to overturn the election. But these are major fraudulent cases in these five states. And if, if their votes are nullified, which would happen, and uh, then uh, I don't think they can possibly say, well, you've got to have another election. It just can't take place in time. 
So the, the thing would then go into the House of Representatives, and you'd have each state voting as a unit, not 100 votes, 20 votes, but one vote per state. And the Republicans control a majority of the states. Well, we'll see. Well, something else is going on in the news, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, as if this isn't enough, we've been waiting to see. You remember the, uh, uh, the New York Post had an article that somebody had found a laptop uh, that belonged to Hunter Biden, and it was so explosive, they brought it out, and then nobody in the media picked it up. Nobody covered it. It was a major, major story. As one senator said, it's as serious as, as a case of cancer, and yet they ignored it. And we learn now that the majority of people, not the majority, but maybe 40 percent of the people had known that this kind of shenanigans was going on. They would not have voted for Biden. They would have voted for Trump. But now uh, it's finally come out. And now the election's over. There's a Justice Department investigating the finances of Joe B Biden's son, Hunter including scrutinizing some of his business dealings along with China and with other transactions. The revelations put a renewed spotlight on questions about Hunter Biden's financial history. And the thing, the tax investigation was lost in 2018, the year before the elder Biden announced his candidates for president. And uh, Hunter Biden uh, on television said, I have not talked to my father about this. He was lying. The father said, I knew nothing about it. He was lying. He, he was on a debate with President Trump, and he lied. He said, oh, I've been cleared by all these experts who said there's nothing there. And that is just not the case. And so I was thinking that, sure enough, there was going to be a lawsuit against the Bidens, but this is the opening gun. And why are they doing it in, in, in the tax court? Because a tax case gives them access to other nations. Other nations will divulge tax probes. They will not necessarily divulge something having to do with fraud. So this is a tax case. But you remember what got Al Capone in prison. It was tax evasion, not corruption. Well, the Senate has investigated Hunter Biden, and a review of the committee report by Fox News found that its details his past dealings with Chinese nationals, including associations with Yi Jingming, the founder of CEFC China Energy Company, and his business associate, Gwen Wing Dong. The report says, quote, Hunter Biden had business associates with Yi Jingming and Gwing, uh, Gong Wing Dong and other Chinese nationals linked to the communist government and the People's Liberation Army. Those associations resulted in millions of dollars of cash. The report says those relationships started in 2015 while Joe Biden was still president. And you remember he bragged before uh, the uh, uh, the Council on Foreign Relations, that when he was uh, uh, vice president, he uh, had a prosecutor fired who was investigating some of this stuff. I mean, he bragged about it. And so there's a string of corruption that makes you sick. And it isn't known if the Justice Department is looking into those transactions, but nevertheless, they're going after him for taxes. Whew. John, you got more. That's right, Pat. Turning to the coronavirus, as the United States hits a new high in daily deaths, lockdowns are destroying livelihoods, and now some business owners are fighting back. The question now is, will a vaccine arrive in time to slow the staggering surge and save crippled businesses? CBN's George Thomas reports. With the virus exploding across the country, officials from California to Michigan to North Carolina are imposing strict lockdown rules again. 13 counties in California shutting down indoor and outdoor dining. Tui's, one of the more than 30,000 restaurants in L.A. County, caught in the ban. We can't pay our employees. We can't pay our vendors. It's, it's very frustrating. Restaurant owners took their case to court, but even though a county judge ruled health officials did not provide enough proof to justify banning outdoor dining, they're still closed because of statewide lockdown. 
California businessman John Cox telling CBN News that Governor Gavin Newsom's arbitrary restrictions are killing small businesses. It's being absolutely decimated by these lockdowns and, and they're not based on science. The food and beverage industry, more than any other sector of the economy, is bearing the brunt. So far, more than 110,000 restaurants across the country have closed their doors either permanently or long term. Based upon our most, most recent forecast, we're now estimating $215 billion in lost revenue, which is just staggering. On the vaccine front, the Food and Drug Administration's advisory committee meeting today to decide whether Americans can begin getting Pfizer's vaccine shot. If approved, distribution could begin in days with more than 2 million doses ready to ship. Meanwhile, the UK reporting that two healthcare workers who took the Pfizer vaccine had allergic reactions. Officials now warning people with a history of significant allergic reactions not to get the shot. News that Americans could start getting the vaccine in a matter of days could not come sooner. The U.S. had its deadliest day Wednesday, with 3,250 people dying in a 24-hour period. George Thomas, CBN News. And Pat Bloomberg is reporting some 110,000 restaurants have closed due to the pandemic. I tell you what I, I've said before, and I'll say it again, this lockdown is insanity. We pointed out uh, a report that I had uh, gotten from that imprimis thing from uh, Hillsdale. Uh, an expert had, had said there may be 130 million people who will die of starvation because of these lockdowns. We just can't do it. And uh, it, the science is bogus. And to lock down all of California, to, knock, to lock down these restaurants, the restaurants won't buy the vegetables. The vegetables, therefore, are not going to be planted. The people who work in the farms won't have a, have a job. The farmers go broke, and it takes it all the way up and down the line. It will destroy our economy. And I know they say that the people who are vulnerable are the elderly and those with some uh, existing conditions of sickness. And they should be put in quarantine. The kids ought to go back to school. They ought to play sports. And there's no reason in the world you can have, if you have open air stadiums where you have to have uh, a third of the stands full and two thirds empty uh, because of some COVID. If they're outdoors, it, it is no problem. And uh, it's time we get real on this stuff. We cannot lock our economy down anymore. We can't do it. But these big cities want to do it one after the other. And now the state of California looks like they're doing it. It's a terrible, terrible thing. And they're going to destroy their economy. And we don't want that to happen. OK, next story. Well, up next, yeah. make China great again? Chinese leaders say that's not only their goal, that's their mandate from heaven. Can the rest of the world stop them? And if not, what happens next? Then trafficked across 33 states and forced to turn tricks for countless men. How could this sex slave escape alive? Find out, that's later on today's show. Economic, military and political domination. You know, it used to be the emperor said, I rule by the mandate of heaven. But the mandate of heaven was to give him blessing, and it was to have the favor of heaven. But China now says we have a mandate from heaven to rule the world. And America is in its crosshairs. From a Chinese spy courting U.S. politicians for intelligence to aggressive propaganda on college campuses, and the head of the FBI says about every 12 or 24 hours, we've got another case of Chinese spying. So who's sounding the alarm that China is now the number one security threat to the U.S.? George Thomas brings us the chilling details. The warning from the head of America's national intelligence was unprecedented as it was clear and unequivocal. China and its communist government pose the greatest threat to democracy and the free world since World War II. 
John Radcliffe, Director of National Intelligence, wrote in a recent Wall Street Journal editorial that China is America's number one national security threat and that Beijing intends to dominate the rest of the planet economically, militarily and technologically. Michael O'Hanlon is with Brookings Institute. It is the way a great power with a non-democratic government chooses to seek to extend its influence worldwide. Radcliffe accuses China of deploying what he calls a rob, replicate and replace approach in its ambitions to dominate the world. It's been well known for decades that China tries to copy the industry of other countries and then takes it to scale, makes it more efficient uh, and largely operates, uh, sort of built its, its way up through the global economic ranks with that approach. China's foreign ministry dismisses Radcliffe's claims while accusing Washington of unnecessary playing the China threat. The relevant article with a sensational title does not present any solid evidence at all. It offered nothing new but repeating the lies and rumors to smear China. CBN News has documented China's rise for more than two decades. Fast forward to 2020 as we examine how China's President Xi Jinping has been massively overhauling the country's military, economy and political influence as part of his great rejuvenation project. Which to put it into sort of Trumpian terms means to make China great again. Tom Miller documents China's rise in the book China's Asian Dream, Empire Building Along the New Silk Road. Miller says since taking the reins, she has been on a trajectory of preparing China to be the world's dominant power. And under Xi Jinping, you know, China has been very, very deliberately um, trying to realize its kind of ambition to become the global superpower. Chinese scholars say it's also part of Xi's deep belief that his country has a divine right to rule the world. The mandate of heaven is from China's imperial past, um, where Chinese emperors believed that they not only had the right, but they were compelled by heaven to rule the world. And there's this notion of Tianxia, or all under heaven. One way is by military force. As commander-in-chief of the world's largest fighting force, she has remade China's People's Liberation Army, or PLA, into a military rapidly closing the gap on U.S. firepower. The Pentagon revealing for the first time that China now has the world's largest navy and plans to double its nuclear warhead arsenal in this decade, which includes ballistic missiles that can reach the United States. It is likely that China will seek to build a military that is equal to or in some cases superior to the U.S. military or the military of any other great power that China perceives as a potential threat. O'Hanlon says China's capabilities in emerging technologies such as robotics, artificial intelligence and next generation technology and telecommunications now rival that of the United States. If we used to be ahead of China by, you know, half a lap on the proverbial track, um, now we're ahead by maybe a few strides. And China is maybe even closing the gap further as we go. Radcliffe insists that resisting China's ambitions of becoming an economic, military and technological superpower will be the challenge of our generation and warns that America should prepare for an open-ended period of confrontation with Beijing. George Thomas, CBN News. There was a time I thought China would be the largest Christian nation on the face of the earth. There were millions of Chinese Christians. But Xi has put the screws to that. He's banning churches, breaking down churches, forbidding the building of churches. Uh, he's re-educating the so-called Uyghurs, the Muslims. I mean, he is just an absolute uh, vicious tyrant. And he surprised everybody uh, from what amounted to a relatively peaceful people that I, I, I just loved. I was over there many times <clears throat> with the Chinese, and I felt he, we have some dear friends in China. And then to see the reverse of that the whole country, and to me it's shocking. But the challenge to the next administration and the fact that now we're talking about Hunter Biden doing deals with Chinese, and that in itself, you've got a president who would not resist China, but would be to make the Chinese delighted. But the fact that they have spies coming in and they actually picking young legislators and funding their campaigns and building them up so they'll have people in all levels of, of our government. 
Uh, it is incredible. It's not the Russian threat that we have heard so much about. Nonsense, not Ukraine or any of those places. It is China. And when I was there, I mean, they were wearing Mao Zedong suits. They were riding around in bicycles. And I could not believe what I've heard in the last few years, how they have become a, an economic power. It's just, to, to me, it's mind-boggling. The, the progress of, of China technologically has been nothing short of stupendous. But it is an incredible threat to you and me and all of us that we love. Terry? Well, up next, she was looking for a knight in shining armor, and she wound up getting pregnant by a pimp. This sex slave looks back at her years as a prostitute and tells us how she escaped for good. Living in 33 different states with countless pimps, Soraya was a sex slave for more than 17 years. She cut herself, burned herself, and tried to kill herself to escape the pain of her sordid life. So how did she survive to tell her story? You're about to find out. So I learned being a prostitute that there was only three ways of getting out of the, what they call the game. It was either being sold to another pimp, going to jail, or being dead. And for me, I was sold physically sold from one pimp to another. For over 17 years, Soraya Hastings lived the life of a prostitute and drug addict, searching for the love she never had. The top two biggest things that led me into the lifestyle of prostitution was money and acceptance. From the time she was a toddler, Soraya was exposed to sex and using drugs. At four years old, she was molested by a close relative and would be for years to come. And she never said anything. All my family members was doing the same thing that I was being shown. So there was no purpose of me reaching out and saying there's something wrong with this or help me or get me out of this because it was, it was so normal. Still, she hoped to one day find someone to love her but the words of a family member gave her no hope that would ever happen. Every little girl wants to be married, wants to have their, their knight in shining armor come. And he said, the only way I would ever have that is if I was in a pimp and hoe relationship. And that was all I was good, would be able to lay on my back. That thought was cemented in her mind when at 12, she was gang raped at a party. I was then known in my whole city as the, the slut, the hoe, the, the girl that you could take to the bathroom and do whatever with and she'll be fine with, with it. Having sex was the only way Soraya thought she could get attention. But inside, she hated who she had become. It got to the extreme point where I just started trying to commit suicide and started cutting myself. I tried to burn my body. I would put fire to my arms just so that I wouldn't feel the pain anymore. At 18, she was recruited by a pimp and walked into a world where her only worth was her body. The minute after he told me that I was going to be his hoe, that same night is when I began to actually officially prostitute and start walking the streets and going into the truck driving parking lots and making deals with truck drivers. And when she couldn't make the quota, her pimp threatened to kill her. She escaped from him, but soon met another pimp who got her hooked on cocaine and crystal meth. Soraya would spend the next eight years being trapped in drug addiction and prostitution, living in 33 different states with pimps too numerous to count. When I was able to take a shower, I would scrub my body and I could never get the smell of whatever man, I didn't even know these men's names, off my body. Then when she was 28, Soraya found out she was pregnant with her second child by a pimp she was dating. The father of her first child made Soraya give the baby over to her family. 
This time, it would be different. And when I found out that I was pregnant, I knew at that moment that something had to change, that I couldn't continue doing the same thing. She left her pimp and traveled thousands of miles to a pregnancy resource center in New England. While there, a counselor prayed with her. And when she started saying the salvation message to me and to accept Jesus into my heart, there was a rush that was like never before that came over my body. And there was a warm feeling and a, just the most peaceful, most serene feeling. I can't, I, I can't even put into words all of the disgust feeling of me constantly wanting to shower and take all this nasty feeling off of my body it had literally been lifted off of me in that very moment. I no longer had the desire to use crystal meth. I had no desire to smoke cigarettes. That was my first moment of the Holy Spirit just filling me with His love that I had been looking for for my whole entire life. Soon, Soraya had her baby boy. Now at a faith-based residential program, she realized her need to repent. I started asking God to forgive me of my sins. Jesus forgave me when he died on the cross. So if he could forgive my sins and the things that I committed against him, then who was I not to be able to forgive the people that did things to me? Today, Soraya has a job in the healthcare industry and living in a new home with her son, Noah. She's also a staff assistant at a women's shelter where she helps women transform their lives through the love of Jesus Christ. She's written a book about her journey called No More Games. I love my life today. There's so much freedom in knowing who Jesus is. It's amazing. If you feel that you, your sins that you have committed are overwhelming and that you will never be able to be accepted by Jesus Christ, know that no sin is too great for His love. The joy in her face when she talks about her life today is so touching, isn't it? You know, when you have gone down some dark paths, I think the knowledge of Jesus' forgiveness is so powerful. This is what the Word of God says, and He says this about you and me, not just Sariah, but about each and every one of us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He knew, He knew in advance that you and I were going to stray, we were going to wander, we were going to do pathetic things, we were going to th do things that, that would destroy us, except for Him because he comes to redeem what is lost. This woman was lost, so lost, and she knew it, but she didn't know how to fix it. You know, maybe you haven't gone through all the dark paths and roads that Sariah did, but we're all lost until we find Jesus. We were created to have relationship with him, and so, when we turn to other things, whether it's to drugs or relationships or doing things for money that are degrading to us, doing things that damage our relationships with our children, with, with life as we're supposed to celebrate it and know it, when this happens, we are damaging ourselves. We're selling, we're selling our inheritance as the Bible says, was done in the Old Testament for a mess of pottage, for something that cannot satisfy, something that is temporary, something that rips the soul out of us. But God knew from the beginning, and He's made a way for you. If today you are feeling that emptiness inside that says nothing satisfies, if today you've gone down some dark paths and you've said, God could never forgive me for the things that I've done, he already has. That's what Sariah was saying 2,000 years ago. He knew what your life would be, and he went to the cross so that you could have forgiveness, so that you could have a new beginning, so that you could have the kind of joy talking about life with Jesus that Sariah has today. 
He's the redeemer. He buys back what the enemy has stolen from you and he gives you a whole new beginning. If you don't know Jesus, pray with me. Just right now, you can just stop what you're doing and you can begin the journey. It's a journey and it will take some time, but start. Every journey begins with a single step. Let this be your step today. Pray with me. Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. I am in need of a savior. I'm, I'm first of all, God saying, thank you. Thank you for wake, making a way for me. Thank you that while I was still in my sin, you died for me. You gave it all. Thank you, Jesus, for waiting for me. Today, I'm coming home to your heart and I'm saying, forgive me, God. Forgive me. Forgive me for sinning. Forgive me for ignoring you, for turning my back on you. Today, I'm saying, I want you to be mine and I want to be yours. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. Cover all of my sins with the blood that you shed. I, I'm asking you to change the way that I think, the way that I see things. I'm asking you to restore my heart, my life, my soul. Fill me with your Holy Spirit, God. I'm asking you for a brand new beginning. And I'm giving you everything that I am and all that I have. And I'm saying, Jesus, touch me today. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for what you've done. Thank you for what you're doing and for what you're going to do. I pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Listen, that prayer is not just going to change your life here. That prayer is giving you eternity. Walk in that every day. What do you do now? Well, call us. <laughs> call our toll-free number. It's 1-800-700-7000. Ask for the New Day Packet. It tells you what to do, how to grow in your faith. Where do you go now? How do you live? And ask the Holy Spirit every day to come into your life and teach you. This is yours for the asking, 1-800-700-7000. Pat? Thanks, Terry. So many coming to the Lord. You know, the Bible says the angels of heaven are rejoicing over one sinner that repents. One sinner. The whole angels are just praising God because they realize how important you are. So if you haven't come to the Lord, please call. Please say yes to Jesus. Just call on him. It's real simple. Just call. And we've got somebody on the phone who would love to talk to you. As Terry said, 1-800-700-7000. Well, I'm going to tell you something that's very exciting. We've got something else called Helping the Home Front. We do a lot of stuff here at CBN. That's one of them. Buried in debt, a military family struggles to make ends meet as bills continue to pile up. See how viewers like you help these wonderful veteran families right after this. Welcome back to Washington for this CBN News Break. Joe Biden introduced retired General Lloyd Austin to much of America Wednesday as his nominee for Defense Secretary. If confirmed, he will be the first African American to hold that position. Some Democrats, though, are opposing his nomination because of a seven year requirement for retirement for that position. Austin's only been retired for four. Congress will need to grant him a waiver for that rule, as it did for President Trump's first Secretary of Defense. General Jim Mattis, former Secretary of State Colin Powell, called Austin a superb choice. Well, Israel is shooting for the moon again after its unsuccessful first attempt last year. Israeli officials have announced the launch of the Bereshit 2 project. That's President Reuven Rivlin on the left of your screen there with Science and Technology Minister Itzar Shai. The mission is to send a second spacecraft to the lunar surface. Israeli scientists hope to make, uh, make it to the moon in about four years. Bereshit is Hebrew for in the beginning. The first spacecraft carried a copy of the Hebrew Bible intended to be left on the moon after the mission was completed. Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at cbnnews.com. Pat and Terry will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this.
helping the home front, active military, Ariel had to take out a loan just to fly home for the birth of his daughter. Before long, this good Marine, and I'm a Marine, Semper Fi, was struggling just to pay the interest. What's worse, the used car he and his wife bought had turned out to be a money-sucking lemon. You ever had one of them? Yeah, he got one. So where did this military family turn for help? Oh, I've got good news. U.S. Marine Ariel has served his country for over seven years. His wife, Christiana, is thrilled he enlisted after they got married. I don't regret him joining. It's, it helped our family a lot. It benefited us, so, you know, I think he made a good decision. Ariel was away training when Christiana was expecting their first child. They didn't have the money for Ariel to fly home for the birth. Okay, I'm gonna figure something out. I was talking to uh, several other Marines. They said, hey, they have this opportunity where you, they pay for your flight and you just pay them later. Ariel made it home for the birth, but the couple couldn't pay back the loan right away. Soon the growing interest exceeded their minimum payments. And I told them, I will pay you back eventually, but for now my family comes first. They pretty much just said, okay, well, it's gonna continue to build up. Adding to their financial strain was the purchase of a used vehicle that they discovered had multiple mechanical problems. It's been times where we had to sacrifice other bills to pay for the, the car, whatever repair it needed. This car, oh my goodness, it's literally our biggest headache. To deal with the stress, they relied on their faith and turned to prayer. I asked God to help us do it. I know that God will not give us what we cannot handle. New Song Church and CBN's Helping the Homefront partnered together to help this family. Pastor West shared the news that CBN was paying off the loan they took out to fly Ariel home for their daughter's birth. What do you think of that? Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> thank God, right? <laughs> yeah, thank God. We really appreciate that. Well, that would take some stress out of your life, right? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> because you said the car is really the biggest stress in your life. Yes. So helping the home front wants to take care of that, too. We're going to get you working with our, our friends at uh, North County Ford. We're going to look over the car, and we're going to find a way to get you a reliable vehicle. I'm sorry. We've seen the struggle. I've seen your faith, and we get to be a conduit through helping the home front. With the car fixed and the loan paid, this military family now has a fresh start. Thank you. Well, that's one of the nice things we do. And I, I may not want to correct it. It's only active duty, not, not retired military. We repair homes and cars. We pay medical bills, help overdue mortgages, helping the home front. If you want to give donations, it is called Helping the Home Front CBN Center. And uh, it's really nice. These guys are giving their lives for our country. They're serving, and they just don't get paid a lot of money. And it's so hard raising a family when you got a, a, a corporal's pay or a sergeant's pay. It just isn't enough. It only and takes one lemon car to throw you off. Especially, yeah. <laughs> that, 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 that's something else. I mean, that, that, you talk about a, a money drainer. That's it. All right, what else? Well, if there's one good thing we can take away from 2020, it's that we survived. And with that in mind, there's probably no better way to celebrate this holiday season than with the legendary Gloria Gaynor. Here she is with her unforgettable version of the Christmas song. Chestnuts roasting on an open fire Jack Frost nipping at your nose Yuletide carols being sung by a choir Folks dressed up like Eskimos Tiny tides with 
with their eyes all of will find it hard to sleep tonight they know that gifts await them underneath the tree reminders of the gift God said to you and me the baby Jesus who was born on Christmas Day to bring eternal life and teach us all his way and so I'm offering this simple phrase Ninety-two. Although it's been said many times, many ways, Merry Christmas to you. They know that gifts await them underneath the tree. Reminders of the gift God sent. Christmas Day to bring eternal life and teach us all his way and so I'm offering this simple phrase to kids from one to ninety two although it's been said Stay tuned for another round of Your Questions, Honest Answers, coming up next. Time for Your Questions and some Honest Answers. And Pat, this first one comes from Annie, who says, Pat, my 70-year-old mom and her male friend, both widowed, would like to marry. If they do, she would lose my late dad's retirement and health benefits by remarrying. Can she be married by a preacher in a civil ceremony and just not sign paperwork with the state? Would they still be considered married in God's eyes? Absolutely. The minute they commit to themselves, they're going to be married before God. And if they, if they have a preacher, it helps. You don't have to have a preacher, but she's got one. She doesn't have to sign all those papers. And well, why should she lose all that? You know, we have a tax code that mitigates against marriage. Honestly, it's more, it's, you're easier off if you're single. I mean, why don't we change the tax code? But it was set up that way. It's terrible. But in any event, if they're married in the sight of God, that's what's important. When they commit to one another, God will bless it. Okay. Okay, this is Tim who says, Why is there such a divide between Christians about the presence of miracles? Many believe that miracles happen, but some don't believe healing occurs like it did in Jesus' day. Simply watching the 700 Club shows that small and huge miracles happen all the time. Why is there so much doubt concerning his willingness to perform miracles? Well, there's some people, so-called fundamentalists, who believe that the Bible, you know, it says when the perfect has come, they believe the Bible is perfect, and that all the miracles stopped with the first century, and we don't have miracles today. Well, uh, they're missing out on some great stuff, but we, we're seeing the Lord do miracles. We are seeing thousands of dramatic miracles, and the gifts of the Spirit are being displayed in great power. And the Bible says, in the latter days, I'll pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters are going to prophesy. Your old men are going to dream, dream, and so forth. And 
we're seeing the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Some people just don't believe it, but I do, and we, we believe it, and we practice it, okay? Okay, this is Lori who says, Hello, Pat. Over the years, I've heard you say that you practice the presence of God. I would like to learn how to do that. So how does one practice the presence of God? Please be as detailed as you can. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you, first of all, you read the Word, and you let the word live in your heart. My, thy, my word have I, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin. And so you begin to worship God. And then you think or you meditate on God. Do you realize He is the creator of everything? This huge universe He created. He has wisdom beyond all of our wisdom. He is so wonderful. And He is love itself. He loves us. He loves us beyond anything we can imagine. And you begin to meditate on who He is, and, that, and you practice His presence. And you, you stand in His presence, and you worship Him. Mm -hmm. Come into His into His courts. You come in with thanksgiving and with praise. You thank Him for, who, for what He's done. You praise him for who he is. All right. This is Lisa who said, Pat, I've been married for 11 years, and this is not the kind of marriage I want to be in. He's manipulated me and others to get what he's wanted, as well as womanized many women. Given my financial situation, I cannot afford rent on my own. What do you think I should do? Well, I, I don't really know all the circumstances, so I can hardly tell you. But, you know, this guy, I mean, you, you have the perfect out if you want to get out of it. And I, I think... He, 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 at law, he owes you an obligation. You spent years with him, and uh, the fact that he's womanizing and so forth uh, gives you an out. And so there's no reason that you shouldn't go to court and get him to pay support and maintenance for you so you can live alone. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, in, in scripturally, you, you absolutely have grounds for divorce, and, and I recommend that you get out of it. And, and But that, that's what you do. Get a good lawyer and and sue him. We leave you with these words from Romans. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Thanks.